Born on the 8th of November 1896, blue-eyed dark-haired Marie Bickford Dunn grew up in a happy Canadian family, but tragedy tore them apart. Her birth father, Arthur Teddy Dunn, worked as a railroad conductor. Sadly, when Provost was just an infant, Dunn passed when gas leaked into one of the rail tunnels. However, it wasn't long before Provost's mother, Huena, moved on. Shortly after the dreadful incident, Provost's mother married Frank Provost, giving birth to a girl named Marjorie, her family called her Peg. Marie, now Marie Provost, and her sister attended a French Catholic convent school in Montreal. One has to remember Montreal is a city built through the union of both Irish Catholic and French Catholic Canadians. Provost's life had already begun to change at a very fast pace, the family constantly traveling due to her stepfather's job. They finally settled in Los Angeles. Following her high school graduation in 1915, Provost began working as a secretary at a successful law firm. She was mostly an errand girl for the firm, but the firm had some big-time clients, such as the Keystone Studios. On one occasion, Provost went down to Keystone Studios. She had a simple task. She had to get a signature from Max Enid, the head of Keynote Studios. But while waiting to see him, a large man approached her in an excited manner and said, You, stand over here, and when I give you a signal run to the table over there and sit down on the chair. And remember to smile for the camera. The man bossing Provost around was director Ford Sterling. Finally giving in to his demands, she went to sit on the chair, but there was something she didn't know. Rigged from the beginning, the chair and table fell apart the moment she sat down upon it. Mortified by her embarrassing fall, Provost turned to the Sterling, but he simply said it was a good take and bustled away. Confused and humiliated, Provost composed herself and returned to her original task. She had no clue there was a surprise waiting for her. Though Provost managed to secure Sanit's signature, he summoned her the very next day. Provost, feeling nervous, recalled she was ready to cry as she entered his office. However, to her surprise, Sanit smiled and said, I want your signature today, presenting her with a contract. Provost skimmed through the writing and immediately signed the contract when she saw the offer, a weekly salary of $15, which at the time was a significant amount of money, more than $150 weekly. This was an actor's contract, and Provost had just become one of Sanit's bathing beauties. Sanit's bathing beauties were a group of actors who dressed up in bathing suits, played pranks on each other and acted in silent films. However, Provost was no regular bathing beauty, and one day at the Venice Pier, she proved why. During a scene, Sanit asked Provost to pretend to fall off the pier in a comedic way. Having a sense of humor quite different from Sanit, Provost did the mise en scene with a risky improvisation. While Provost pretended to fall, she pushed Sanit off the pier in front of all the crew and the cameras. Maybe this was payback for the broken chair. Even though she initially liked how her idea played off, the horrifying looks from the staff gave her anxiety. Provost thought that Sanit would fire her, but instead, he climbed back on the pier and told her, Marie, your salary is increased $25 a week. Jackpot. After that, she had the stardom and the freedom to improvise. After Provost did a couple of movies, people began wondering about her private life. Then, Sanit stepped in and told people all about her past. He went around and told people things like how she was fluent in French, or how she'd received an education at a convent in Montreal. We don't know how Provost reacted to these rumors, or whether they were true, but we know she had a more pressing matter on her plate. In 1918, Provost fell head over heels in love with an infamous socialite named Henry Charles, Sonny, Jerk. I couldn't find much about Jerk, perhaps he is related to the Angus cattle farmers on Jerk Farm in Illinois. Jerk shared the same feelings towards her, but he knew his upper class family would certainly not approve of a Sanit bathing beauty who acted funny in front of a camera. This wasn't an enormous issue when they were having fun but it would become much more serious years later. So much for his family's bourgeois hopes, in 1924 newspapers revealed Sonny Jerk was a car dealer. Provost and Jerk had a good thing going on, but Jerk ruined everything by making a single suggestion. One night after a party, Jerk convinced Provost to marry him. Even though this sounded like a romantic gesture, 
The proposal came with one big caveat, the marriage must be a secret. Blinded by her love, Provost agreed. In the blink of an eye, Provost and Jerk secretly tied the knot, but bitter heartbreak quickly followed on the heels of this rash decision. Six months after the wedding, Jerk told Provost that he wanted to visit his mother to tell her about the wedding. Provost knew that she should feel relieved, but somehow, the whole situation made her feel unhinged. Provost realized something iffy was going on with Jerk because not only did she learn that Jerk never told the truth to his mother, but he also he came back as a very different man. It was now very clear, Jerk wanted to leave Provost without even celebrating a wedding anniversary together. Looking for a shoulder to cry on, Provost ran to her good friend Sunit, and confessed her scandalous secret. When Provost ran to Sunit in tears and told him her husband had left her, Sunit, in shock, responded, How can you have a husband? You aren't even married. Provost responded, I've been married six months and we haven't even had a honeymoon. Now he's left me. Now Provost and Sunit had to find a way to divorce Jerk as quietly as she'd married him. Despite no longer being together, Jerk and Provost didn't want to get a divorce because of very different reasons. For Jerk, a divorce meant letting people know, in particular his mother, that he'd gotten married in the first place. Provost, on the other hand, feared news of her divorce would damage her career. As a result, the two remained as a married couple, but their secrets would come back to haunt them. A lead role in the Sunit feature, Yankee Doodle Dandy in Berlin, 1919, brought attention to her. In 1919, Provost was not happy at Keystone Studios because she believed a lot of the fun had gone. Sunit knew Provost was about to leave him for a bigger studio, so he had one last trick up his sleeve. Sunit came to Provost with a project called Yankee Doodle in Berlin, his most expensive production yet. The project included big names like Bothwell Brown and Provost's earlier acquaintance Ford Sterling. Provost happily signed on for this, and the movie was a commercial success, yet it wasn't enough to lure Provost back to Keynote Studios. She didn't want the money, she wanted the creativity, so she hit the road leading to Universal Studios. With the help of King Bagot, she signed a contract with Universal in 1921 for $1,000 a week. People like the producer Irving Thaberg took a special interest in making her an even bigger star. They started with small publicity stunts and events, which paved the way for a sensational show. When Thaberg made a shocking request of the actress, Provost was already on board. She went to Coney Island and burned her bathing suit to officially say goodbye to her bathing beauty days. Even though Provost had a good run and did a couple of light comedies with Universal, her contract was about to expire. Right on time, the industry giant Jack L. Warner stepped in with an irresistible deal with Warner Brothers. The prestige and the money made the offer too good to refuse, so Provost committed herself to a brand new establishment, without knowing its shortcomings. With a new studio came another Mackie over to rebrand Provost's public image. Warner had a multi-layered plan to boost Provost's stardom which began with creating this image of Provost as a champion swimmer in Quebec. He even got some phony gold medals made for her. After presenting her as a world-class champion, Warner wanted to move on to his next idea, which was extremely complex to execute. In 1922, Provost already started working on her new project, The Beautiful and Damned. Interestingly, Provost with her bob cut looks a lot like Fitzgerald Muse Zelda Fitzgerald. Unlike this Muse, Provost's life and ending would be tragic. Behind the scenes of the beautiful and the damned, sparks flew. Not only was she working with Kenneth Harlan, but she also saw him in her spare time. The onset chemistry quickly turned into a romance, which Warner recognized immediately. This gave him an idea to moneyize the palpable chemistry between his two stars. However, Warner didn't know Provost's dirty little secret. Following the movie announcement, Warner made a shocking announcement. He purported that Harlan and Provost were on the verge of tying the knot and would do so in reality on the movie set. This garnered huge attention as fans sent gifts and letters to the couple. Warner was over the moon about his dishy publicity stunt, but it was about to explosively backfire on all of them. It didn't take long for the media to learn about Jerk and Provost's marriage, and they certainly didn't think twice when they published a story about it. One morning in 1923, 
Provost woke up to a headline from the Los Angeles Mirror that stated, Marie Provost will be a bigamist if she marries Kenneth Harlan. This was about to shatter her attentively drawn public image, and more importantly, shatter her relationship with Warner, who had never known the truth. Marie Provost's scandalous first marriage kicked up some negative publicity and Warner was livid, but at least, some good came out of it. How? Well, when Jerk heard about it, he finally filed for divorce, which Provost didn't fight at all. After years of being stuck in a pretend marriage, Jerk and Provost divorced in October 1923. She was finally able to move on with her life out in the open, and her new beau Harlan, a former dancing partner to Gertrude Hoffman, still waited for her with open arms. Provost and Harlan quickly became inseparable. Their on-screen dynamic entertained audiences one more time in the movie bobbed hair while their off-screen relationship moved to the next level. In 1924, only a year after Provost's divorce, they decided to become husband and wife. They started off on a high. Even though Provost and Harlan preferred to keep their marriage under the radar, they were soon widely celebrated as the romance of the Hollywood year. While the media dubbed them Hollywood's perfect marital team, they bought a large home in Hollywood Hills and continued with their successful careers. It seemed like a fairy tale. One day in 1926, Warner met with Provost and Harlan to give them some troubling news. Their contracts were about to expire, and Warner let them know that he was not going to renew them. This came as a shock and a huge inconvenience for the couple who had just started a luxurious life together. Regardless of their feelings, the decision was final, and this marked the beginning of a chain of unfortunate events for Provost. Just as Provost tried to recover from her career disappointments, another disaster struck. On the 5th of February 1926, Provost got some news about a car crash in Lordsburg, New Mexico. There was an overturned vehicle with actress Vera Stedman, the studio owner Al Christie, and Provost's mother, Huena, in it. Vera Stedman was another bathing beauty. Born in 1900 and dying in 1966, she was a strong swimmer and graduated to a female lead in Senate Films in 1918. She then moved to Al Christie's studio. She had twins with popular jazz orchestra leader Jackie Taylor, and she named her female twin after her close friend, Marie Provost. The Stedman-Taylor marriage ended in 1923. Following their divorce, Taylor refused to play alimony despite leading big bands at the Montmartre, Coconut Grove and Hotel Roosevelt. In 1926, Stedman's car overturned in New Mexico while traveling from Los Angeles to Florida. She and O. Christie were hurt in the accident while Marie Provost's mother died. Newspapers reported a back wheel had come off of the vehicle, causing the accident. Newspapers also reported Stedman's chauffeur, A. Todd, was the only one in the car who escaped injury. This was the beginning of the end for Vera Stedman. She struggled and lived with her daughter Marie, and her mother. By 1934 she was bankrupt. In 1935, she married Martin Padway, a tire manufacturing executive. This marriage lasted until 1938 when Stedman divorced him, claiming he beat her. In 1941, two cars struck Stedman as she crossed a street on the way to a market. This accident broke her back, and surgeons told her she would never walk again. This forced 18-year-old Marie Stedman into the movies to work to support her mother. Her twin, Frances Stedman, died sometime in the 1920s. No white privilege at all. But Vera Stedman would walk again. In 1948, she married for the third time to Joseph Milton Flynn, an ex-jockey turned hospital ward attendant at Birmingham General Hospital in Van Nuys. She died in Long Beach in 1966. Practically every girl star I know has been through the school of hard knocks, and naturally such girls don't have a fragile and pampered look, she said in 1927. This quote was true for Stedman's friend Marie Provost, who didn't know how to deal with the loss of her only remaining parent, so she began to numb herself by finishing one bottle after another. Her grief, her mental instability, and her new habit greatly affected her life. According to her sister Peg, Provost's already fragile mental state completely broke down after an incident near Christmas time that year. According to Peg's accounts, Provost had a scarring interaction with a girl on her way home from dinner. While driving her car, a little girl jumped in front of her car, 
and despite Provost hitting the brakes, the girl suffered some bruises. Luckily, the girl's light injuries healed in time, but for Provost, it was a different story. One has to remember car culture developed very quickly in California, and so where once cars on the road were a rarity, they were suddenly everywhere. Car crashes were common, safety features such as seat belts and safety glass were not implemented, and driving could be incredibly dangerous. Constantly in fear, Provost stopped driving for a year. She didn't even want to be in a car, so she would often take the streetcar to work, which was an odd thing to do if you are a well-recognized Hollywood star. As her sister Peg put it, imagine, earning more than a thousand dollars a week, and riding on a streetcar. Provost grew weirder and depressed by the day, and her husband started acting up. As of 1927, her teetering career due to the alcoholic bloat and personal problems sent Provost spiraling into a pit of despair. Even her husband Harlan dealt with his own downfall. Provost struggled with drinking, and Harlan joined her on the self-pity train with a dire gambling addiction. The couple was already disastrous, but Harlan made everything worse. Harlan's gambling problem quickly got out of hand, and Provost was too busy with herself to realize it. According to one of Provost's good friends Phyllis Haver, Harlan began losing thousands of dollars and often forged Provost's name on checks when he ran out of money in his own account. It's a good thing our girl finally had a wake-up call and the couple separated. In May 1927, Provost wanted to officialize her separation from Harlan, so she filed for a divorce. Harlan began babbling about how Provost was never home and that her workaholic and absent behavior was the major factor in their separation. Knowing how publicized their relationship was, Harlan obviously wanted to hurt Provost's public image, but instead, he ended up aiding it. In retaliation, Provost called one of her co-workers to give testimony during the divorce trial. Surprisingly, this co-worker was not an actor, she was a nurse. This key witness let people know Provost worked as an unpaid nurse at the Los Angeles hospital in her spare time. After the nurse basically called Provost an angel, Harlan looked like a total villain. As the exhausting court hearings came to an end, Harlan was nowhere to be found. Despite his best effort, the judge granted an interlocutory divorce and even called Harlan a cruel, uncaring, and uncivilized man. Provost rose above all the drama as the hero of this story. Only 13 months later, people spotted Harlan and Provost together. The news of their reconciliation was everywhere as the two prepared to embark on a second honeymoon. Harlan even gave a public statement saying that Provost planned to set aside the divorce papers. She did set them aside them for a short amount of time, until she realized the mistake she'd made. Of course, Harlan and Provost's reunion was short-lived. They got back together in 1928, only to break up in 1929. This was probably because Provost was still trying to get out of a career rut and an emotional whirlwind, while Harlan seemed to be in recovery. The divorce was final as of 1929 and it was the healthy thing to do, but it still exacerbated Provost's depression. It could not have aided Provost's condition to know her former love would marry again. And again, nine times in all, to Doris Hilder Booth in 1930, Phyllis McClure in 1932, Helen Spetner in 1934, Rear Walker in 1957 and Rosemary Gensel's Merjanian in 1963. Harlan, whose uncle was comedian Otis Harlan, died in 1967. Provost's depression had physical consequences too. She had a short-lived affair with Howard Hughes, who cast her in her last leading role in 1928 as The Racket. She was said to be heartbroken by the breakup. After the divorce from Harlan, people began noticing changes in Provost's appearance. Due to the occasional binge eating and excessive drinking, she gained a considerable amount of weight and lost her charming looks. Already struggling to find new projects, she was pushed out by new starlets and officially downgraded to secondary roles. Studios didn't care about her car crash trauma and put her in car crash focused films such as 1930's War Nurse. One can also spot her in 1931's Gentleman's Fate, where she is quite the ham. She does great alongside Jean Harlow in 1931's Three Wise Girls. Do you have a favorite Marie Provost film? Reportedly, Provost wasn't too bitter about losing her leading lady status. In fact, 
when she landed a smaller role in one of the last silent films of the acclaimed director Cecil B. DeMille, she did everything in her power to give a good performance. She even said, that's the way it is, when it came to getting smaller roles as an actor. Provost slowly realized she'd begun fading into obscurity. She tirelessly worked to rescue her career to an extent, but no matter how strong her performances were, her roles kept getting smaller. Without her even realizing it, she was almost out of the job market. This led to desperation. With weight problems on the one side and the fear of not getting a job ever again on the other side, Provost lost control. She desperately tried crash diets including semi-starvation diets, liquid diets, and developed unhealthy habits to look in shape, so that maybe she could get a tiny part in a movie. At first, she sold her glamorous Malibu home and moved into a small apartment, relying on her friends who were still in the business for handouts. Then she began isolating herself from the rest of the world. In the meantime, Provost's sister Peg tried to contact her. She wrote to Provost a couple of times, but the only reply she got was a brief postcard in 1936. In the postcard, Provost asked Peg to go see her last film 13 hours by air, in which she only had one scene. Provost didn't even have a line in her scene, yet she only wanted the one person left in her family to watch her act. She had appeared in over 120 films. Her sister, worried about Provost, wrote and asked to see her, but she never got a reply. Days and months passed, and nobody knew what Provost was doing. She lived alone with her Dachshund, and it was clear she didn't want anyone to bother her. Nevertheless, one day in 1937, the apartment manager, or houseboy, depending on the source, decided to take action. The neighbors had been complaining about Provost's dog Maxi and its constant barking. When the apartment manager Harry Jenks approached Provost's door, he found a note. It said, please do not knock on this door more than once as it makes my dog bark. If I'm in, I will hear you. I am not deaf. At first, the manager knocked once, but as the dog kept barking and there was no answer, he entered with his key. On the 23rd of January 1937, the apartment manager found Provost's 41-year-old lifeless body on the bed. What made this death even more tragic was the fact that Provost passed a few days prior, yet no one knew about it. Tragically, the official report stated that Provost's little Dachshund had chewed up her arms and legs in a futile attempt to awaken her. At the young age of 40, Marie Provost had died from alcoholism and malnutrition. She stopped eating in an effort to drop some weight, but combined with her drinking problem, this only led to her demise. Additionally, on her bedside table, there was a note to Joan Crawford. It was a promissory note to Crawford for $110. Provost had been accepting money from the actress, her co-star in paid, and owed her. However, it was Crawford who ended up paying for Provost's funeral. You can learn more about Crawford and her relationship with her mother-in-law Mary Pickford on this channel. Big stars like Cary Grant and Barbara Stanike attended the heartbreaking ceremony. But that wasn't all. When people caught wind of her passing with her dog by her side, they started the most outrageous rumors. Provost's poignant end was breaking news, but the stories about her demise made this incident even more sad. Some said that she took her own life, and some claimed that her dog chewed on her remains. In fact, the outrageous stories inspired a popularized book called Hollywood Babylon which included a story about how Marie Provost's dog ate her to survive. This myth continued to spread until the reports showed otherwise, but it left a tragic mark on Provost's legacy.